Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be talking about physics and formula networks and how we can use them for uh, simulations of like quantum dynamics of electrons. So, uh, we'll begin with a brief introduction on machine learning and time dependent density functional theory. And then uh, we'll discuss some results for uh, the time dependent Schrodinger equation. And then uh, discuss the progress that's been made towards using pins as solvers for the Kuhn-Sham equations. So what is machine learning? I mean, I made this talk for a broad audience. So uh, we'll also start from a little bit uh, basics. And uh, it's the study of algor computer algorithms that automatically improve through experience. I mean, but what is experience in this case? So there are lots of uh, different types of machine learning, but we'll focus on something called supervised learning. And here the experience is the computer sees more data and uh, makes predictions based on that data. Uh, so machine learning has been uh, in a lot of applications uh, since the last few years, uh, general applications like chat GPT, which I guess you all know, and voice assistants and self-driving cars and object detections, but also in science, uh, like our homegrown Mala. Uh, then, can you see the pointer? I can't no. see any pointer. We can't see the pointer. Uh, okay, I lost the pointer, but but okay, fine. Uh, also, yeah, uh, it's also used for uh, uh, accelerating end body simulations for cosmological problems. As uh, that's what the volumes represent, and the third image is uh, for image classification from. Uh, electron microscopy images. So uh, what is a neural network? Uh, neural network is a learning model where we have a bunch of uh, trainable parameters called neurons, which are vaguely inspired by artificial, I mean, biological neurons. But uh, the way, the way we train them is by uh, comparing its predictions to some ground truth that we already know. Uh, how do they work? So uh, Okay, uh, I can't get the pointer to show up. Okay, uh, so what we have is, it's a chain of uh, linear regression operations where each neuron performs a linear regression followed by a scalar nonlinear activation function. And, uh, at the end, so we have an input, 
then the input passes through the uh, input layers and then propagates through the network and uh, we get a pr prediction output. Uh, now we calculate some sort some sort of loss function, which is the difference between difference metric between the prediction and the ground truth for that particular input. Uh, once that is calculated, we use something called back propagation, which is uh, based on automatic differentiation, to calculate the gradients of. Uh, from the output to the input. Using those gradients, we tune the weights of the neural network using gradient descent algorithms. And our goal is to find an optimal uh, set of parameters that minimize this loss function. So basically, uh, maximize the uh, maximize the similarity between the prediction and the ground truth. Uh, in this case, the loss function is based on just the difference. And we assume that we have some ground truth. Uh, but what if we don't? And here, comes uh, physics and from neural networks, where we use the network as a solver for a partial differential equation. And uh, that we convert the uh, solution of the equation to an optimization problem. Here, the inputs are coordinates and parameters. And let's say we have some system F and it's of this form where there's a time derivative and some other uh, differential operators that, uh, that are parameterized by uh, lambda. And uh, we define some boundary conditions and initial conditions like we do when we solve uh, differential equations. And we construct a network that acts as the solution. So the output of the network is the solution of for this system at that uh, coordinate uh, point. The way we do this is we use the residual form of the differential equation, and we want this to be as close to zero as possible for that uh, for that solution. And we uh, generate a new loss function where the L of F, the green term, denotes the value of the residual for the neural network predicted solutions uh, in the interior domain, as you can see in this uh, chart. The, uh, and the boundary and initial conditions are uh, the data-driven parts where we specify what boundary conditions and initial conditions uh, we want. And uh, here, the loss function is uh, simply the some difference between the specified boundaries and the predicted uh, and the solution, uh, the predicted solution at these boundary points. Uh, but the uh, pins are also flexible in the sense that we can incorporate data that we already have. So we can create new loss functions that combine both um, uh, both uh, um, uh, normal loss comparing ground truth and predictions and the PDE loss, which measures how well the solution fits the PDE. And this is especially useful for physics problems because we might not have enough data, but we might have some underlying theory and we can fit some noisy data to that theory to get better uh, approximations. Okay, uh, now moving towards uh, time-dependent density functional theory. So we begin with uh, the electronic structure problem. Say we have n e electrons uh, at 
locations uh, are underscore and uh, and ions at locations uh, capital R underscore. Uh, they are governed by the Schrodinger equation, and uh, all the information about the system is contained in this uh, equation. And here we use the Hamiltonian with the von Oppenheimer approximation. So we uh, decouple the ionic and electronic interactions. Uh, in this case, we'll only uh, worry about uh, all electron systems. And the, so, uh, the Hamiltonian consists of a kinetic uh, energy term, the electron-electron Coulombic inter interactions, and any other external uh, interaction. And for all electronic systems, we also consider the uh, interaction between ions and electrons as external because it, it's fixed for the time domain we are interested in. And uh, but this solution, this is a differential equation in three n e dimensions, which becomes intractable for even a small number of electrons. Uh, and yes, we'll use atomic units throughout. So, but so what do we do with this uh, intractability? Uh, from the uh, Honenberg uh, cone theorems, we know that uh, the density of the system uh, is equivalent to, uh, contains all the information uh, when, when the total energy is, uh, when we have a, uh, when we uh, minimize total energy. So, Uh, here, what we do is we use the cone sham formalism, and we uh, we define a system of j a fictitious system of j non-interacting electrons. So we don't have the couple terms here, and then we solve uh, we solve this system, and the density obtained from the uh, orbitals here, non-interacting orbitals, is the same as the true density. And then we can uh, get, get different observables from the density. And uh, so for this fictitious system, we define an, uh, an effective potential, which consists of the external potential, the Hartree potential, which uh, is the Coulombic interaction, and the exchange uh, correlation potential, which, uh, which, uh, to which, uh, of which accounts for everything, uh, for all the errors in other approximations. Now, uh, we don't know the exact form of this uh, potential, but we do know it exists, and uh, different approximations are made for different systems. So we converted the problem with three any dimensions to a problem of just three dimensions. Uh, and we just need to find the density now. So this is used for ground state uh, calculations. And we can extend it to the time dependent case, uh, the time dependent Schrodinger equation also. So here the wave function is evolving in time with some potential that also varies with in time. And from the Runge-Gross uh, theorem, we know that the time dependent density is enough to describe this system, uh, as similarly to the last case. So now we have time dependent cone sham equations, where uh, again, uh, we need to, the density of the fictitious orbitals is the same as the real system. And now we, but now we have a time dependent uh, potential, effective potential. So why machine learning and DFT? So uh, DFT has 
a lot of applications and is used by a vast number of uh, scientists for in chemistry, material science, physics. And the DFT calculations consume a significant amount of HPC resources. For example, if you look at the figure on the left, uh, you can see that chemistry, material physics, and uh, material science and physics uh, account for about 75% of the usage of the INSIGHT cluster at Argonne National Lab. And uh, a good chunk of uh, these uh, of these jobs would have been DFT. Uh, and there has been a rising interest in using machine learning for DFT and uh, material science in general. Uh, as you can see from the plot on the right, it's almost an exponential rise in the number of papers uh, which apply machine learning to uh, different problems in this field. So now, uh, why do we want to accelerate uh, the TDDFT solution uh, calculations? Uh, here, we want to use the physics informed neural nets as solvers for the time dependent Kohn-Sham equations. And this is because uh, they generalize well over different parameters. So in using a numerical solver, we would have to run the whole calculation each time we change some parameter, but uh, we can design pins where uh, it's already trained on a whole set of parameters and it can interpolate well between those parameters. And this would also support uh, rapid modeling of electronic response properties in scattering ex uh, experiments. Like I think uh, uh, like the uh, European XFEL, and so basically, it would aid in uh, help in better experimenting. Uh, okay. Now we show some results for the time dependent Schrodinger equation, uh, which is a linear PD here. And it consists of. So we use the time dependent Schrodinger equation as defined here. And uh, or we use a harmonic potential as uh, defined the Hamiltonian. And the domain is fixed from minus pi to pi in space and zero to two pi units in time. Uh, we are looking at the uh, superposition of two uh, states two eigenstates, and uh, I'll show some results of it, different, uh, different eigenstates are being used. And the we already have an analytical solution for this as defined here. Uh, so we design a pin where the input is uh, coordinates, which is x, because it's a 1D problem here, uh, time, and this parameter omega, which defines the potential. And we, the, output of, the output of the spin is U and V, which are the real and imaginary part of the solution. And then we use automatic differentiation to calculate the gradients and the resultant PDE loss to train the network. So we'll look at two systems. The first one on the left is uh, the system that consists of superposition uh, of ground and the first excited state. Uh, you can see the density evolving in time here. And uh, on the right, it's the superposition between the ground and the third excited state. Uh, and when you look at these uh, snapshots, the squares, you still can't see the pointer, right? Okay. Uh, now, yes, for some reason. <laughs> uh, that's 
okay, fine. Okay, so these snapshots, this makes it easier. Uh, these snapshots are, uh, so uh, throughout this presentation, uh, I'll represent the results in this form where each square contain, uh, is X on the X axis and T on the Y axis. And uh, the colors represent uh, either wave function or density values. So it's uh, a 1D domain. So each row is uh, the domain at one time step. And as I said, it's from minus pi to pi and from zero to six pi, uh, two pi in time. <laughs> is it gone again? Okay. Uh, fine. Uh, so here I show the results for uh, the ground state and the first excited state. And uh, in this plot, the first column the, represents the true values. The second column represents the predicted values and the third column uh, shows the difference. And uh, the first row is the real part of the wave function. The second row is the imaginary part and the third row is the density. And uh, as you can see from the figure on the right, where uh, 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 the density is plotted at different time uh, steps, uh, the bold colorful lines are the true densities and the dotted line is the predicted density. And as you can see, it matches pretty well. And uh, here the mean squared errors are also uh, very less in the 10 to the negative five rate. Uh, now we have a pin where we train a pin with omega as an input along with X and T and uh, train it on a range of omega values. Uh, so the training set is generated randomly using random sampling of uh, omega values from uh, the domain within the red lines, that is from 0 0.75 to two. And then we test it on uh, a fixed grid of omega values. Uh, as you can see, it generalizes very well across the training domain, but when we go outside the domain, uh, the errors increase uh, significantly. And this is also due to the fact that uh, when omega is too low, the wave function spreads out and then it won't obey the boundary conditions for a fixed domain. And when omega is too high, uh, the features become too sharp and that is uh, a problem for uh, normal pins. Uh, so uh, pins, favor low frequency solutions and also okay uh, on the figure on the left uh, we show results for the same system but now the time domain is not 0 to 2 pi it's 0 to uh, 6 pi and as you can see, uh, the predicted solution converges to a steady state. And uh, the same thing happens also in the middle figure where we uh, show results for a higher en energy system. And here also the solution just converges to a static ground state. Uh, I plotted the static ground state on the right for reference. So what is happening here is uh, the only information about energies is contained in the initial condition. Uh, and uh, it's difficult for to maintain uh, some temporal causality uh, with normal sampling methods. So the as we move farther and farther away from the initial conditions, the solution starts converging to uh, the simplest ground state solution. 
which fulfills the residual loss function that we had defined, even though it doesn't fulfill, uh, even though it, it's not the solution, it's, it's not the correct solution specified uh, through the initial condition, but uh, the residual loss turns to zero for this solution also. So the pin converges to that. So what do we do now? We need to make sure that the uh, information from the initial condition is uh, propagated throughout the time domain. And we do this with a causal loss function where we have a set of, uh, we generate a set of time points, which are random, but we order them uh, in a non-decreasing manner. And then we calculate a weighted sum, uh, exponential sum of the points from the current time point to the initial condition. And the goal is to uh, minimize this loss for uh, for all the points. So uh, with uh, here I plot the uh, mean squared error in the density prediction uh, through time. And as you can see with the normal pin, we get very high errors and but when we switch to the causal pins, uh, the errors dissipate quite a bit. So these are the results with the larger time domain. Uh, now here I show the uh, causal pin solution on the right, which is much better than the uh, normal fully connected pin. But again, uh, it's a challenge to uh, keep the to get the correct solution for a very large time step with pins. And uh, here I, uh, are the results for the higher energy states. As uh, in the figure on the left, as you can see, is the nor uh, uh, fully connected pin with the normal loss function, and on the right we have. Uh, the pin with causal training. And uh, the errors are much lower by orders of magnitude uh, magnitude in the case with the causal training. Uh, in here, we uh, compare a normal neural network to a pin or, or a hybrid neural network, which combines both uh, the data driven loss and the uh, uh, PDE loss. So uh, here we only have we uh, we only have training points uh, within the red lines, and we use this to train a normal neural network, and then uh, show the solutions on the whole grid. Uh, as you can see, the errors are slightly lower in the training region, but then extremely high uh, everywhere else. Uh, but uh, in the, on the figure to the right, we combine the loss function. So yes, it still has the data driven comp component, but we add a very small uh, weight of the PD, comp uh, PD loss. And uh, in this case, you can see that it performs much better. Uh, even in the domains that are outside the uh, training data set. Uh, so here are some results for uh, for the, here are some quantities for the results I just showed you. And uh, so training a pin takes a relatively long time as compared to, you know, just running a numerical uh, a solution, but uh, it's very fast at inter interference. And this actually is, is uh, the main advantage also for generalizability because you can get multiple solutions very quickly. And 
Uh, also, uh, you can see that the causal training improves the error quite a bit for the same inference time because uh, we don't, the uh, causal training, we are only changing the training procedure. So uh, the network architecture is the same. And so the inference time is the same. Uh, and uh, this is a little bit obvious, but as we increase the uh, sampling density for calculating our loss function, uh, the training time step increases uh, exponentially, but also the um, uh, the error in prediction decreases quite a bit. But once we train it, uh, then the inference time is fixed. And we can always improve training time with uh, parallelization and by doing domain decomposition on our system. Uh, here are some results for the 3D uh, quantum harmonic oscillator. Uh, here we shouldn't look at the mean squared error because uh, most of the space is zero valued points and that brings the error quite a, a by quite a, down by quite a lot. But uh, even the maximum absolute error is uh, of the order of negative four, which is uh, uh, very good for the system. And these are some slices from the 3D volumes I just showed in the last slide. And uh, here you can see that the solutions look pretty close. And uh, on the left in the middle column, uh, you can see that there's some noise in the imaginary predictions. But when you look at the magnitude of that noise, it's uh, very low. So now, what do we need to do to have a cone sham pin solver? So let's look at each term of the uh, cone sham equation. So we uh, we already get the uh, kinetic energy term from the pins because we get the gradients. Uh, through automatic differentiation. But how do we get the other terms? So uh, we can define the external potential uh, using a formula or by uh, using, uh, by just reading the data of the, uh, like ju just reading the value of the potential at different uh, points in space and time. Uh, the Hartree term is a little bit tricky because we need to calculate the non-local potential over the entire grid. And uh, so that means we have to evaluate uh, our predictions for a, a fixed re grid at each training point and then uh, perform this uh, integration numerically through quadrature, uh, which is a little bit expensive. And uh, we need to define the functionals for the exchange correlation. So the way that DFT and TDDFT calculations are done numerically is through, well, uh, the self consistency if you, uh, equation. And uh, here uh, on the left is the general algorithm for hello. Oh, okay. It's the general algorithm for uh, performing this. So we start with an initial guess of the density, then we uh, use the density to calculate the effective potential in the 
uh, cone jam equations. And then we solve the cone jam equations to get the new set of uh, cone jam orbitals. And from that, we get a new density, density up. And we repeat this process till the input density is the same or like within some tolerance uh, to the output density. And from that, from that we can get the uh, converged to densities, uh, orbitals, and energies. Uh, for the static DFT case, we need to perform this over all space. And we need to solve this eigenvalue equation. So here the uh, computationally expensive part is the uh, inversion of the matrix to get the eigenvalues. And in the TDDFT case, we need to uh, get the self-consistency, self-consistent density over all space and time. Uh, in practice, we don't actually enforce this over all space, but instead we break, I mean, over all times, but we break the, uh, we break it into, uh, we discretize it into very small time steps, and then we enforce the consistency between each time step instead of uh, globally. So, uh, here is one algorithm of doing numerical pro propagation, time propagation for TDDFT. So we approximate the time evolution operator using the midpoint rule, and it becomes an exponential. So the wave function at the next time step depends on the value of the Hamiltonian at the half time step using the midpoint rule. And uh, from the, I mean, there are multiple uh, algorithms to approximate this, but we need to make sure that it is still a unitary operation. So we use uh, the crank Nicholson algorithm, which does both forward and backward propagation. And uh, so this makes sure that the uh, uh, operator stays unitary. And so now what we have is we actually need to calculate the Hamiltonian half a step into the future to get the next step, uh, time step of the wave function. So how do we get, how do we look into the future? So here we enforce local self-consistency we use the predictor corrector scheme. So we use the Hamiltonian at the correct uh, current time step to guess, uh, to op obtain the first guess for the orbital at the next time step. Once we have that, we can uh, run the corrector step for multiple times where we approximate the Hamiltonian with uh, using the densities we got from the uh, from our guess, and then refine the solution using the new Hamiltonian and the new guess. Uh, and we can keep doing this iteratively till the density converges for this uh, set of, I mean, these uh, two time steps. And we run it from zero to our, like, at the end of our time domain, and we get a self consistent density. But in practice, uh, in numerical codes, uh, even this is not done. So instead, what is recommended is that we use much finer uh, discretization and then only run the self-consistency for uh, self-consistent calculations for the first few time steps, and then just propagate, it, uh, propagate the uh, orbitals in time uh, without enforcing uh, the self consistent But as we have seen with causal loss, we can include a lot of information from uh, history in our, uh, in while training pins. So here I propose a 
an algorithm to do the self-consistent calculation globally over the entire time scale. And uh, what we have now is we, I mean, the input is the same as the space uh, time coordinates and parameters, but the output now is, uh, represents different cone sum or uh, the different cone sum orbit orbitals. So we can have either multiple neural networks where each is one orbital or one neural network with uh, two n outputs for n orbitals because uh, we need two outputs for per orbital. And here, yes, we calculate the gradients, but we also calculate the density and the uh, effective potential within the uh, pin itself, and then calculate the loss and the cone charm equations. So here we need to have two loops of convergence. So what we do is we start with uh, random weights or uh, whatever initialization, we get an initial prediction of the orbitals. Then we can calculate the density and the effective potential. Uh, now in the first loop, we train the network. So we calculate the cone sham loss and till the loss is converged, the network loss is converged, we keep sampling new points from the domain. Uh, once that loss is converged, then we use the orbitals to calculate the new density. And uh, then do the, uh, then enforce self consistency in density again. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the outer loop is looking for density convergence, and the inner loop is looking for uh, solution convergence of the orbitals of the network. Uh, so now I'm working on uh, systems with interacting electrons. So we want uh, we want to calculate the heart rate term the, and the exchange correlation potential uh, term inside as part of uh, network training. And uh, combining all the orbitals and to calculate the density and the uh, non-local heart rate term is uh, challenging, but we are working on that. And we, uh, also looking at time-dependent external potential. So here are the systems I'm working on now. Uh, on the left is, uh, so the first plot is the uh, laser pulse in time, then uh, uh, which acts as the time-dependent external potential. And uh, below it's a hydrogen molecule density. And as you can see, the orange line is the potential of the laser pulse. And our goal is to uh, simulate this system with pins. Uh, in the middle, the snapshot shows the evolution of the system in time. And uh, as you can see, it's uh, oscillatory in nature with some high frequency, like highest frequency components. And on the right, we have uh, electron scattering on a hydrogen atom. And here, the problem is that the features are very sharp. So both this is, these systems are uh, challenging for uh, normal pits. So now we need to, now I'm working on how to, yeah, basically design the pins to uh, simulate these. So uh, in conclusion, we want to use the pins because uh, one, they give us a mesh-free solver so we can generate uh, solutions on the fly for grids of arbitrary resolution. Uh, we can also combine pins with uh, numerical solvers. So 
we use the pins to generate code solutions and then uh, use numerical system, uh, solvers to uh, polish it basically. And because pins are basically a neural network that works with automatic differentiation, it works well with, it would work with other uh, MLDFT workflows. Then we uh, we saw how pins, uh, the parameters are generalized. Uh, we can uh, generate pin solvers that generalize well over different values of parameters, which is a significant advantage over numerical methods. Then we can also uh, design the KS pin to enforce global size consistency. And pins can also be used for inverse problems. Uh, like uh, potential inversion. Uh, but the challenges here are, as this is a neural network, yes, it's a black box algorithm. We can't derive new physics out of it. Uh, it is resource in intensive to train the pin for bigger higher dimensional systems. And as you saw that uh, the performance of pins is very dependent on certain architectural decisions. So designing pins is not uh, very intuitive and uh, a bit of experimentation is needed. Okay, uh, yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Attila, my supervisor, uh, Nico Hoffman from HZDR and Patrick Stiller, and Juan and Michael Head from Casas, and Vincent and Aurora from UC Mercy. Okay, any questions? Thanks, Karan. Uh, let's open this up for questions. Um, I would have yeah. some. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, maybe one simple thing which I completely missed was uh, like the transition from the quantum oscillator to to like more complex scenarios. Uh, so how is actually the pin constructed? Uh, so do, do you have also the uh, uh, spherical harmonics and uh, the eigenstates? And the fre frequencies of those, or what's what's the input of the network magic? Uh, so here we are only looking at the time dependent case. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, we are not solving the uh, eigenvalue problem, getting the energies, and uh, we are working with a real space grid. Real space. So, so basically, like mapping pixel of input to pixel of output, more or less. Yes. Uh huh. But, no, so, like the input is like some x of xi, and the output is ui, which is the solution of the equation in that code. But wouldn't it make also sense to, to use something spectral, some expansion, like for example, do the spherical harmonics? Uh, because, yeah, many. Uh, in many cases, uh, it might not be exactly like that, uh, the qu quantum oscillator, but might be relatively close. And, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, yes. Uh, so there are some architectures where instead of uh, just the coordinates, we use uh, like Fourier features from the domain. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. If you can formulate it in terms of spherical harmonics, that is also. For good. example, yeah, I, I I don't know. Yeah, for example, could be. Uh, and uh, yeah, somewhat related question is uh, if, or as I understood, what what you are predicting or calculating uh, is just like the complex value. Of, of the weight function, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. That, that's the output. So wouldn't it be 
Laura, that way, I, I think you cannot enforce some some symmetries, right, of the of the problem. So also, wouldn't it be better to somehow compose uh, the output from some basis or something like that, which would directly reflect some symmetries of the problem? Um, yeah, this this could help maybe with with, with uh, the time dependent equations because uh, you would you would uh, conserve some uh, invariance, for example, and uh, yeah, like for that oscillator, you you wouldn't lose any any energy or uh, something like that. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so yeah, have you played with that idea somehow or? Uh, not with uh, different basis functions, but. Like I played with more constraints, like you know, we can conserve the density over time and so on. So you can add that to the loss function that we don't want the solution to have different densities and different time steps, for example. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, you're right. For example, many DFT codes use a basis set and not necessarily a real space a basis for that reason to preserve some of the memories of the system. That's yeah. Definitely can be done if you use right. If you use your basis set conveniently, then you can also reduce the number of basis functions you need. So you can reduce. also yeah. also that's another reason. Yeah, I think all of that can be done. Uh, so it doesn't the pin is not bound to um, the real space grid. Yeah, also kind of this. Uh, is related, I guess Juan is not here anymore, to what Juan is doing or what people are doing in Michael Hecht's group. So they do similar things on, on the polynomial basis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, related. Well, 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 yeah, um, depends on, on, on the problem, right? Yeah. Uh, but here probably spherical harmonics would be would, would make most sense and and something built on top of that, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so I had another one, but I just forgot. <laughs> maybe someone else. Uh, well, maybe I want to ask again, uh, Karan, the, the slide at the end on the global uh, self consistency. I, this was too fast. I kind of missed. Could you explain that again? Um, so, so, yes. Here, right? I mean, so you explained earlier regular TVDFT, right? There are schemes to enforce mm -hmm. consistency. I missed the connection here, actually, but that it would be nice if you could explain that again. Okay. Uh, so, while training the neural network, we Wait, uh, like one of the conditions that we can apply is that, okay, let's uh, train it till the loss function converges to some value. Uh, we can use this to update the density. Like we don't have to update the density and the expensive uh, effective potential terms at every training point. But uh, with with the say density at time step uh, at iteration t, we uh, use it to calculate the orbitals for iteration i plus one. And once we get a stable answer, we use the orbitals to calculate the density i plus one and so on. So since until we see some convergence in the density. So, uh, we start with some value of density and defective potential, uh, run the training loop till the solution converges in uh, like in the Koncham loss, and then we update the density again. Okay, yeah, I think I got it, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I remember that one. <laughs> uh, so, um... I a little bit missed how what what that ca ca casual uh, causal also causal 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 uh, network networks do actually. So uh, the architecture is the same, but we change the way we calculate the loss, basically for mm -hmm. the pins. 
uh, so here we have a set of parameters epsilon, which uh, are, are like different weights for this function. And basically you, you generate a set of time points from zero to T and you calculate the sum uh, which uh, so basically uh, like uh, the exponential here uh, like it uh, basically like assigns different weighting to like depending on the distance in time Mm -hmm. And by controlling it, we can make sure that uh, the uh, solution is correct for all points in time, because mm -hmm. uh, we only specify the uh, like the uniqueness of the system in the initial condition. Mm -hmm. And there are multiple values in the domain, multiple solutions in the domain, and the system tends to converge to the uh, simplest one. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. And normally, like when you would compare it with this, uh, with the classical approach, then yeah. uh, you wouldn't have that exponential term, like decaying the. Uh, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no okay. the, yeah, the classical approach would just be the norm of the solution. Okay, I see. Yeah. I mean, the residual, not the same. So, sorry, I can have one question. Can you open the slide where there was like a, a longer time and uh, the network failed to? Oh, this. So, um, I'm wondering uh, have you looked into uh, because there are like three parts of the loss function? Uh, have you compared where is which error? Because I don't uh, know. Yes. For so, yes, uh, there are. Uh, so, like, we can use adaptive, like, weight, uh, like, loss weight rebalancing. So, we change the. Like, are you talking about normalizing the input and output, or? Uh, no, no, no. I'm just uh, asking because, like, uh, at the bottom, it seems smeared out, right? Mm -hmm that it's not so sharp as the as the true wave yes. function so like i would expect that the um the the, the physics uh, loss the self consistent loss would be would be higher in this in this region mm -hmm. so maybe yeah. you could like i don't know if uh, like increase the the weight of the loss here or increase the weight of the loss everywhere yeah. uh, how does yeah. it uh, so in in particularly in this case, I have done like manual weighing. So I give the physics PD loss like a weight of ten, and everything else like weight of one. But uh, that doesn't really help here. It just uh, increases the training time. Uh, but there are some promising approaches where you uh, uh, like dynamically rebalance the loss function depending on what the gradients are at that time. Mm -hmm. And and one, I don't know if it like it seems like it would help like in in either case because you you pass in time in the input like one scalar that goes from zero to roughly twenty, right? Yeah. So uh, if those systems are usually periodic, you could uh, instead of passing just t, you could uh, expand it in some like uh, Fourier space. For example, pass in sine of t, sine of two t, yeah. sine of three t, until you get enough of them and, and cosines also. Then, then the network uh, it is easier for the network to to learn such oscillating functions, and then you could maybe get some like extrapolation ability because you you only trained it on on a fixed square of of those x, y, and uh, t inputs, and with 
And like, uh, I wouldn't expect this kind of network to extrapolate like over the 20 times because yeah. the <laughs> network is le learned linearly. Uh, I actually just read about this, uh, like uh, being applied to pins uh, a few days ago. It has a funny name. It's called like a finger net or something. And uh, yes, uh, you basically use uh, sine and cosine functions to capture the periodicity. So, so maybe one question again: uh, Have you have you uh, experimented with how, how well it works on extrapolating? Like, for example, you you train on a part of the let's say the the the, the positions plane, like the x y. And you then look how it behaves outside of the of the square you trained on. Uh, I mean, for this, it just gives a zero solution. But I haven't looked at it in a more interesting system because uh, here, like outside the peak, it's all zero. Mm -hmm. So here I've done it. It's like in the quantum harmonic oscillator, but. Uh, if I increase the domain, it's just uh, uh, zero valued. But uh, this could be actually be useful for this case where we can uh, make the domain size like inversely proportional to the frequency. So as the wave function spreads out, the domain size also increases. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all from me. Any other questions for Karan? I have a question for Karan Kushal here. Sure. Uh, so you're using crank Nicholson scheme for time propagation, what you explained earlier. Uh, so I think you must be using extremely small time steps because it's second order. Right. Yes. Right. Uh, but I think you, you might want to check how the density varies as a function of your time step because at some point you would need fourth order. Accuracy. Oh, okay. when you propagate. Yeah, I mean, uh, so uh, I haven't faced the problem yet. Like, uh, actually, for the hydrogen molecule system in Octopus, I was using the default, like, uh, fancier time propagation scheme. And there, the solution always blew up to like NANDs. For okay. different time steps, I tried a bunch of different parameters, but then I just switched to uh, crank Nicholson and it started working at least for this simple system. Okay, final, final round for final call for crank. If not, then okay, thanks again. Let's thank again, Karan. Thanks for the talk. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. All right. And yeah, bye, Karan. See you soon.